Hey there, Power Platform Enthusiasts. Stefan Superflu here. Welcome back to our channel. I've had a user request to go into our CapEx authorization form in a little bit more detail. Now, this form layout is not my doing. One of my amazing coworkers, Nick, came up with this, showed it to me when I was getting ready for a webinar. So I can't take credit for it. But I wanted to do a multiple part series going into more detail because I've had requests from users to go over it. So let's just cover the main portions of it really quickly. We're leveraging modern controls for some of it. We have the ability to do filtering by different regions here and searching. We can also create new requests from the main screen. And if we hit cancel and go back, we can go into more depth or detail on every one of the screens. Here's the original request form in a view fashion. Here we have a tabular expense details, and I'll get into this in a different video. Here we have attachments that are tied to it, and I have already covered this in another video. I'll link both of those below. And then we have approvals, a multi-stage approval process, capturing where it is in the process and what the comments were, who approved it, and what time at each stage. I'll cover that in another one as well. But today, what we're going to leverage is this main form here. We're going to lay it out, we're going to create the filters, and we're going to get the bones of it set up for you. Now, the data set here is all SharePoint, but this could be Dataverse or whatever data set you like or are using in your environment. Don't forget to hit subscribe so you get notified when I do all the other videos. Let's get started. Here we are back at the finished app. I'm going to go back into the back end. And the layout here, we're leveraging the header and footer layout, the dynamic one. And we just moved this section up one just by doing that. Reorder, set it up one. Then if we go back, you can see we have that layout going on. Now, because we're leveraging the responsive screen layouts, when we come in here and we add our elements to the different sections, they're going to automatically stack for us. A lot less work that we have to do. Now, for the header container, I have a logo and then I just have a title. And if we look at the container itself, it's justified to the left and we're aligning vertically. We could align center and you don't really see much change here. We don't have a gap because I didn't want anything to gap here. I wanted it all to be tight. And then the color, I'm leveraging a variable. Now let's look at that. If we go to the app on start, I'm leveraging all my colors. So we can set our colors once use them everywhere, and if the client changes their mind, we can always just change it in one place. It's so much easier. Work smarter, not harder. Now you'll notice in the second section here, I have our search and I have some drop downs, but if I play the app, you'll see that I have more usable space than I'm seeing in the back end. You'll notice also in the gallery, we have that same thing going on. I'm leveraging a responsive container here so they'll automatically stack so I don't have to worry about all the things off the side because I know they're there and I don't need to worry about it. Now in the gallery we have something else going on because galleries can be a little tricky. Right here I leveraged just references to get everything laid out the way I wanted. Now could I have used containers here? Absolutely. I just didn't in this use case. Everybody uses different things in different places and that's Fine. Everyone has their own programming language. Just make sure you comment everything so that your coworkers don't hate you. <laughs> now, if we go back to the new screen that I just created, let's create the top portion here and just create the placeholders for the filters. So I'm going to go down to the screen we just created, select the top header control. I'm going to make it center. I'm going to give it the background color. Now there's multiple ways to do things in Microsoft. I can come down here to color. I can click on the, the paint bucket and select something from here. I could go to custom and put in the hex, or I can just leverage my variable, my primary color. And there we have it. I can then add a logo and that's going to be an image. And I really like when I'm using images in a container like this, a responsive container, to not make this height or width static. I want to make it relative. So parent height times 75%. And then I like to take and make the width self.height, if I can type. And you see IntelliSense is helping me with this. Now let me grab the logo and I'll put, put it in here really quick. To add the logo, first you have to upload the media. If you click on the ellipsis here, and go to media, you can see I've already uploaded the images here. So I can click on the icon that I've, or the image that I've added here, click on image, 
and I'm just going to set it to Sky Ranch. There's the logo. You see it's too small though. So we need to make the width a little bit bigger. I could leverage a flexible width and that'll have it fill the space. Problem with that is we want to have a title in there, right? So I'm going to go back to insert and I'm going to insert some text. I'm going to use a text label. Now this is really the one that we want to have dynamic. So I'm going to change this one back to a non-flexible width. I'm going to select this and make this one a flexible width. So now it's filling the space. I'm going to make it centered. I'm going to make it just because this use case is not going to be used on anything except desktops. I'm not going to worry about making it dynamic. I'm going to come down and change the color to white and let's make it bold. So there we have the basic of that. We do need to make this bigger. So I'm going to leave the height as that. I'm going to change the width though instead of self dot height. I'm going to make it 350. There we go. We have a little bit of more buffer there. So this is going to be the cap X form. You could have whatever you want in there. Now in here we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to take the color, primary color, and then we're going to start adding our, our items. So we're going to do a text input. That was the first thing that we had, a search box. Now I'm going to insert a couple combo boxes. And I'm going to leverage classic combo boxes. I've run into some issues lately with, with modern combo boxes. And just I'm sticking with the classic for now, for this. And now I can copy and I can paste. Now you see how everything is stacking right on top of each other and it's in the top left. We're going to fix that now. We're going to make it still justified left, but I want everything centered. And then we're going to leverage something here called the gap. And that'll automatically give us a gap between everything. However, you see, we still have the text input to the left. I'm going to make that 20 and 20 on the right. So we have everything nice and centered. Now our first text input here, we don't want to have default text. So I'm going to delete that and I'm going to add some hint text. Let's go back and look at the finished app. So here in the hint text, I'm actually leveraging one of the emoji icons that you can get by hitting the, the Windows key and the period on your keyboard. And you can leverage any one of these in your app. I kind of like the look of it. So we have the hint text as the search icon, project description search. Now here we have the combo box. Now, if we go back to our main, our, our new screen that we just created, how can we take a blank combo box and get the actual items from our choice column? Well, I could go in here to capital authorization form, and then here I could do all of this, right? But I'm a lazy IT person. So what I like to do is I like to, in the screen that I'm working on, go to form and select an edit form. And then I'm going to tie it back to my data source again, in this use case is SharePoint. And this is going to give me the backend code for the combo box that I want. So what was this very first combo box? Let's go back and look. It's going to be a report class and then we have business purpose. So back to the screen we're working on. Report class isn't here, but once I click on the form, I can go over here to fields and I can add that field. Report class, right? And then the other one was business. I think it was business. Ah, oh, it's already there. So we have report class, so I'm gonna add that. Now if I click on this combo box, looky here, we have the code that we want. So I can copy that, come up to my combo box, put that same code in here, and there we have all the items. Work smarter, not harder. Now, personally, I hate the default text. I understand why they do that. Let's also change this to combat uh, CB. I use CB for combo box. You use whatever you like, but be consistent. And this is report. Oh, it's being used somewhere else. So let's change it in the main screen. Report two. So there we have that. Now let's click on advanced and scroll down because here's where we can change the default text in here, the find items. Mm -mm. Select a report class. There we go, now we have everything. Now let's go back to our main screen. I've done the same thing for all of these other ones. Select by region, business purpose. If we play the app, right, we also have a refresh button and another button over here. Now I said that modern controls aren't quite ready for prime time and that's true, but I'm taking a risk here because I really like 
the function of the new buttons. And let me show you what I'm talking about here. I'm just going to hide these two, or that drop down for a minute. Now, if we click on the button here, there we have it. I've named it button new because we're creating a new request here. I can actually put the icon in the button and have it be at the front or the back without having to do any sort of layout or fussing with it. It's just easy. I haven't run into any real issues with this portion of it yet. Just a button with text and an icon. So far, so good. Fingers crossed. And that's at the time of this recording. More of the modern controls are becoming more stable as Microsoft is working on them. So when someone selects this new button on the select, what are we doing? We're setting a variable for the form mode. So remember when we added that form a minute ago, it's just got added as, and if we look at it by default, these forms get added in a mode of edit. That's just what you got. That's just what it puts it in. Now you could manually new or view on all of these, but if we go back to the main screen, look what we have here. When I click new request, we're setting a variable var form mode and we're setting the form mode to new and then we're navigating to our screen details screen, right? That's what I called it. So if I click on new request, it takes me to this screen. The form, if I click on it, this is a modern form. The default mode is var form mode. So I'm able to leverage this screen for this purpose. And if I click here in the second header, you'll see that the items here, this is a modern tab or yeah, modern tabs list. And as the form mode changes, the items in the tab change. So if this form is in an edit fashion, I'm going to show request details, expense details, attachments, and approvals. If it's not, if it's view or new, I'm only seeing request details, which is all we're seeing here. If I hit the cancel button, it's clearing out the variable for this form item. We're resetting the form, we're clearing some other stuff, we're setting some variables, and we're going back to the main screen. Now let's select one of these items that have already been added to SharePoint. It's the same screen details, the same thing you just saw. We're just seeing the form mode in edit. Pretty easy, right? Work smarter, not harder. You don't have to create multiple screens for everything. Now that we have our text input, and our drop downs, we have a reset button and I have a button for new. Let's go down to the next level. Here we have a gallery that I should probably rename to gallery items. And now within the gallery, I have this item title. So this is the title of the request that someone has submitted through SharePoint. Now, if we look at the X and Y for this, X is eight, Y is eight, the width, is one third of the window size or the space that we're given within the parent. And then the height's 31. Now, if we go down to status, here we have some text. We have the text of status. And then from this item, the status. We're leveraging the X of the title right above it. And you see IntelliSense is highlighting and coloring things for us, green and green. And the Y is the title height plus the title Y. So it's gonna automatically stack it right there for me. If we go over one, we have the project start and the project start date. And it's X is again the title X plus the width. So it's gonna put it right next to it. The Y is gonna be the title Y. The width is going to be a quarter of the space given and the height's gonna be 31. You see how we start building this out. The region is gonna be the same thing, right? We have a quarter of the space. The Y is going to be the label status. So this sets us up so that if we change anything, everything will change for us. The width is going to be a quarter of the space. So if we play the app, you see this is taking a third, this is taking a quarter, and then we have the other ones bouncing off of it. We could have leveraged containers for this, but I wanted to show you two different ways of achieving the same thing. Now, let me turn that combo box back on and let's play this. So. These are all records being pulled from SharePoint. If we filter by region, we only wanna see North America. I can hit the reset button, it resets my combo boxes. Let's say we wanna look at renovation and Latin America. We have multiple filters that we can leverage for this one gallery. So if we look at the gallery, and I'll have this code in the description for y'all. I'm gonna format the text. What we're doing 
is we're doing a search off the text. And you'll see here we have a squiggly line. We have a delegation warning. There are videos all over the place about how you handle delegation. Um, I'm not going to handle that in this video. Let me know in the comments below if you want me to handle it in another video. I can. But this was for a demonstration. This is not a live app, so I didn't need to really worry about it. So we are searching our filtered data source. And if it has been filtered or not, doesn't matter. We're going to search our data source off of the text that someone has put in the search box off the project asset description. So we're only searching within the project description. We tell them that in the hint text. Make it easy for your end users to understand what you're trying to get from them. I'm going to make this just a little bit smaller here so you can see. Now, what we have next is off of our data source. So we're going to search whatever is in with these two parameters or within this parentheses. We're filtering now. Here's our data source. That's our SharePoint list. Now we have our first drop down box. You see how it's purple. So that goes to filter or report class. So if report class has a selection or it's blank and the business, the green one that you see here, has something or it's blank and the region has something or it's blank. You're starting to see what we're doing here. We're building on each one of these. You can copy, rinse, and repeat. If we wanted to add any more combo boxes here, we would just copy this code that I'll put in the description. Oh, rem uh, just as a quick reminder, if you're a member to my YouTube channel, you can download this video and play with it to your heart's content. So copy, rinse, repeat all of these different guys. Just add another ampersand, another pair of ampersands, and the code, and you'll be good to go. So let's play it one more time so you can see it. We have a responsive screen layout with a logo and a title. We have a text input with hint text that disappears when we click into it so we can search within things. We have filtering off multiple data sources. We have a reset button. Let's look at the reset button one more time. Icon reset. On select, we're resetting the text box and all the combo boxes. And then we have a new request button that when we click it, it's setting a variable to a form mode of new so that this is a new form input. This is a modern form control that will submit our data to SharePoint. And then we're reusing this screen for our next video, right? So the next video, once we have this screen laid out, and I'm going to go back, once we have this screen laid out and you have your data coming in, the next thing that we're going to do is take that data, we are leveraging that same modern form control, and we'll build this out in the next video. We're leveraging a default mode of a variable. So var form mode is going to be edit because we have data here. And we're going to leverage modern tabs and set this up as well so that we can then create our tabbed data input that allows us to add new rows and calculate here at the bottom, just like it's an Excel spreadsheet. This is tied to a separate data list using a master ID reference in our SharePoint list. Then we have attachments that end users can actually come in and work on. I have a video for that. It'll be in the description. And then in the, another video we're going to cover, I've already done a video on sequential approvals. This one is different because what we're going to do here is do it in stages. We're going to have the first stage be regional finance approvers. And then in the comments, we're going to capture who did it, what stage it was in, when they did it, and if they added any comments, and what stage the overall approval is in. We're also, in one of these videos, going to, you see here how we have approved, completed, pending approval. We're going to have different ways to submit things to our end users. Hit subscribe and follow along for more. If you found this tutorial helpful, please give it a thumbs up and leave a comment below. Let us know your thoughts, questions, and any topics you'd like us to cover in future videos. Sharing is caring, so don't forget to share this tutorial with your fellow Power Apps enthusiasts. Until next time, keep learning, keep exploring, and keep rocking Power Apps like a true pro. See you in the next video.